Welcome to chapter eight of Intro to Psychology. In this video, I'll be discussing the parts of the brain that are involved in memory. There are two main parts of the brain that we'll be discussing in this video, and those are the amygdala and the hippocampus. Uh, we previously learned about the amygdala and the hippocampus in chapter three. Uh, so the hippocampus is a brain structure that controls consolidation, uh, the transfer of new information into long-term memory. Uh, one specific function that the hippocampus does that is very unique is that it, it tags uh, episodic memories uh, with the correct time and space information uh, during rehearsal and consolidation. So when you experience an event, uh, and any memories that you form about that event are tagged uh, or are classified uh, with regard to time and space so that you can remember them later. Uh, then there's the amygdala, which is a structure that processes uh, emotional information uh, so that it makes uh, it easier to remember. Uh, so we often find that emotional memories are easier to remember than uh, emotionally neutral memories, and that has a lot to do with the uh, neuroanatomical structure of the amygdala and its location uh, right positioned right on the hippocampus. And the amygdala is also activated by the sympathetic nervous system, our fight or flight uh, system. So uh, under periods of high stress, uh, it interacts with the hippocampus. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in a moment. Much of what we know about the hippocampus and the amygdala comes from the case of H.M., uh, Henry Malayson. Uh, who was a 27-year-old man who suffered from severe seizures uh, ever since having a uh, brain injury uh, early on in his life. Uh, he underwent brain surgery in 1953 with the hope of treating his seizures, and the, se uh, the surgery was initially very successful. Um, uh, they removed his hippocampus and his amygdala, and his uh, seizures went uh, down. Uh, but he also suffered some unexpected and really devastating consequences uh, in that he was unable to form uh, many types of new memories. So he was unable to learn new facts. Uh, he was unable to learn new skills. Uh, or I should say he was able to learn new skills. Uh, but after learning those skills, he would have no recollection of, of learning them. So he would learn how to use a computer. But then after a few moments, if you were to ask him, uh, he would have no conscious memory of ever having used one. And then he could also not remember uh, new faces and had uh, difficulty remembering events even moments uh, after they occurred. And so his case provided tremendous insight into the role of the hippocampus uh, uh, in uh, regard to helping us transfer uh, information from our sensory memory into our long-term memory. Another interesting uh, application of uh, what we know about the amygdala and the hippocampus is the study of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so it's an anxiety disorder caused by experiencing very stressful or life-threatening uh, or traumatic events. And someone with PTSD often relives the traumatic event through nightmares, flashbacks, hyperarousal, uh, as well as avoiding situations that remind them of the traumatic event. So for example, uh, someone who uh, experiences a very scary car crash, uh, when they ride in cars, they might uh, experience flashbacks. They might feel like they're reliving it and as a result uh, may avoid uh, riding in cars in the future. And so during these, uh, during high stress situations, such as when you're experiencing a traumatic event, uh, the hippocampus becomes uh, dysfunctional. The activity of the amygdala uh, kind of inhibits or suppresses the hippocampus and what that means is that uh, whereas um, episodic memories are typically stored uh, with regard to time and to space, uh, they become incorrectly stored uh, when the hippocampus is under stress or when a person is, under, uh, is experiencing a traumatic event. And so when someone with PTSD experiences any situation that's similar to the traumatic event, uh, the brain misperceives the traumatic event as actually really occurring again. Uh, because the memories of the initial traumatic event were not properly stored. They were kind of uh, jumbled when they first were encoded, were first in consolidated in the brain. And so they come out in, during situations uh, that are not appropriate, such as during nightmares or during flashbacks. And we often think of PTSD as being primarily associated with the military. People have experienced uh, traumatic events in the, in the theater of war, uh, but they can come from a variety of different situations, including, as we mentioned, car crashes, uh, physical assaults, traumatic childbirths, uh, house fires, uh, and, and many other instances of abuse or life-threatening situations. 
Another interesting uh, application of what we know about the uh, areas of the brain involved in memory is Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia uh, that results in progressive memory difficulties as well as a host of other cognitive problems. Uh, and so from a neuroanatomical uh, perspectives, uh, we can see very clearly the differences between a healthy brain and someone who has uh, advanced Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so in a healthy brain, you'll see that the cortex has many folds, uh, the gyri and sulci are, are, are pretty close together, whereas in Alzheimer's disease, the gyri and sulci are spread much further apart. Uh, you'll also see uh, that the ventricles, so these are fluid-filled uh, um, areas within the brain uh, that become much enlarged uh, in someone who has uh, Alzheimer's disease. And then there's also the hippocampus. Uh, uh, it makes sense uh, that the hippocampus being the brain structure that's involved in transferring memories uh, from short-term memory into long-term memory, uh, it shrinks uh, in someone who has uh, Alzheimer's disease.